So I am very delighted to be here today presenting this talk. It is brand new. I would love your feedback on it at the end or afterwards. Um, and to kick off, you probably have been told at some point in your life, learning something new or onboarding to a new project, that there are no bad questions. And I agree wholeheartedly with the spirit of that phrase. I think that being curious and inquisitive in seeking information from other humans are essential traits for us to learn and grow as developers. Um, and the question asking doesn't stop just because you've been working in tech for 10 or 20 years. Um, but I don't actually say this anymore to new folks um, or folks that I'm helping mentor or get onboarded. And I'll share a little bit about why. So I myself took a different path into tech, a little bit circuitous. Um, and while I did pass CS 101 in college and went to a software boot camp, when I started my first job professionally coding, um, I had so many foundational knowledge gaps to fill. And that meant I had a lot of questions to ask and I was not shy about asking them. Um, this is me coding away at my beautiful app hosted on localhost on demo day. Um, and so I was personally really lucky to not have to do this learning journey alone. My first team had great support from my manager, from mentors, and from other folks across the company. And this is really important because I was not born knowing about software or Linux or technology. I had a lot of learning to do. And so like some of the early questions that I went back through my notes and found was like asking my, uh, my mentor Gabe, uh, how did you know SSH was port 20? Is there like some magical list of ports I should be memorizing? Or, okay, so a server is like a computer without a monitor? Like I, I was trying to map being a user of technology with becoming a developer of technology. And there, there's a lot to learn. But I kept finding myself kind of like Kyle from Real Housewives here. You ask her what time it is and she tells you how to build a clock. I would ask um, something that I thought was maybe straightforward about a concept or something that I needed help troubleshooting so I could get on with my job and close a ticket or what have you, um, but somehow find myself in like a 20 minute lecture um, that didn't always address the actual underlying question that I had. And after these long winded answers, sometimes interesting, sometimes relevant, I would still have follow ups. And then me and the person I was asking were both like, what gives? Um, why didn't you ask me what you wanted to know the first time? And over time, with lots of patience and feedback from my mentors, I got better at preparing to ask a question, phrasing my questions, and doing a little bit of work ahead of time to make sure I was really asking the right questions. Um, but that's only half of why I wanted to give this talk was how <laughs> was to help other people on their growth and learning journey. Because the more senior I got, I found myself on the other end of that table where I was getting asked a lot of questions. Why is this up here? Well, <laughs> how does this relate? Well, I switched pretty early on from software engineering to SRE, and that meant that I went from being one of many developers who had lots of support from the company to being one operations person supporting 20 plus developers with a lot of concentrated expertise um, on me and my teams. So we were asked a lot of questions, a lot of intro questions, and a lot of not the best phrased questions often. And so I spent a lot of time in help desk helping people get their software deployed and configured for our infrastructure. And this, <laughs> this beautiful work of art came out of a team bonding exercise that said, represent what your team does. And we came up with this alpaca. And the relevant part is, did you make an infrastructure ticket? That was people would come to the help desk channel. They were asking for work. And I probably typed that like 250,000 times. Did you make an infrastructure ticket? Did you do that? And working on help desk and having to answer the same types of questions um, started to get really fatiguing. And I started to understand why a lot of my like grizzled ops friends who'd been doing this for decades used to get the reputation of being like prickly or grumpy or you didn't want to ask them questions because you'd get a really, you know, grunt answer and it would just, it didn't feel safe always to ask questions. And so I realized after doing a lot of dev support, there are maybe not bad questions, but there are definitely low effort questions. And that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today or a lot of what we're talking about. The final piece of the puzzle on this journey is 
asking questions in open source. Because before, I was technically paid to be answering my colleagues' questions, whether or not I thought they should have already known whatever that concept or you know, task that they were asking, um, I was still paid to provide that support. Now that I work um, with a lot of CNCF projects, specifically for monitoring and observability, um, and sitting in the Slack, I've realized very few people are privileged enough to get paid for their work in open source, whether that's direct code contributions or even providing you know, technical support in these forums. And so there's a bit of a, you know, asymmetry there. there. You're not being paid for your time to answer these questions. And so the way that you ask and how you ask and how you come to ask questions specifically for learning and troubleshooting open source software is different. And it takes a bit more effort. And so I think these are broadly applicable to asking good questions overall, but today it's about, I need to learn something about this open source project or concept, or I need help troubleshooting this thing. And so after joining um, a few of these Slack channels, I realized there were types of questions that would get answers. And I could start to see traits of questions that would immediately get hopped on, spark threads of conversation, um, and really help people along their way. And there were other questions that would just not get addressed and just get lost to the back scroll in the sands of time. And I just thought, what happened? Did they find the answer? I have that same question. I wish they had just figured out the answer and posted it. Um, were they able to do the thing? And so, like I said, I'm not going to say that there are bad questions because I think there's always a valid time and you're always going to have questions along the way, but it's about there are low effort questions when you're asking another human for their time or their expertise. So the nutshell for me was the better questions you ask, the better answers you, you'll get. And it can serve as the first steps that someone can take from being just a user of software to being a community member and engaged, and then maybe even to being a contributor. I think questions can be that like very first breadcrumb on that journey. And so not to bury the lead, the elements of better questions are doing your due diligence first, providing background context, considering the channel, sharing relevant details, and giving back. So we'll look at each of these. And when it comes to doing due diligence, this is really focused on asking questions in instant messenger apps. And I will say Slack because that is what CNCF has chosen as their instant messaging platform of choice, but you can substitute in um, whichever one that your project uses. But instant messaging has made it really trivial to go from, ooh, I hit a wall and I got an error I don't understand, to immediately asking a question in a room full of you know, hundreds of developers. And due diligence is about making sure you do a little bit of research before you ask. And the only time I will quote how to ask questions the start way, which is a very hostile document, is there's one quote, hasty sounding questions, get hasty answers or none at all. Because you're asking for a reason. You need to know something, you need to do something. And if you're asking questions that don't get answered, you're not gonna move past that. So when I think about due diligence, these questions that could be better are amalgamations and anonymized versions that I've pulled together from the, from the CNCF Slack for questions of open telemetry. Because this is not about, oh, look at this person, they asked a bad question. No, this is this question could have been better phrased. And we've all asked versions of this. So and that'll hold for every other trait. So does the latest version of the auto instrumentation agent include metrics? This is not a bad question at all. It is low effort because this type of information, you're like one click away from finding out by doing a search, uh, search in a search engine. And for a lot of the projects that I work with, there are really great information in the release notes for whatever given language SDK. So this is something that you could go out and find for yourself right away. And so the rule of thumb is to spend 10 to 15 minutes researching the answer yourself before asking others and bringing it to a group. Because if you're expecting someone to put in effort answering you, you've got to put in effort to ask. And it all starts with research. Choose your sources wisely. It does not have to be my beautiful bookshelf of technical books. Um, but 
I have a huge stash of tech books because authors take a really long time to write them. They're really great at phrasing concepts, leading you through a learning journey, building up foundational concepts. And so books are typically the first source I'm going to turn to when I need to learn an entirely new domain or project or figure my way around something. Books are great. <laughs> and this isn't just about doing a single Google search or whatever search engine you use and calling it a day because I have in the last two years joined marketing and learned more than I wanted to know about SEO or search engine optimization. I will tell you the best, most relevant advice may not always make it to page one of your results. So it really matters what you're using as your research. You could spend 15 minutes looking at the first page of Google and come out none the wiser. It also doesn't mean asking a generic LLM like ChatGPT. Um, I'm sure folks are familiar with the research Purdue put out a little bit ago where they asked ChatGPT 517 questions from Stack Overflow and they compared ChatGPT's answers to the human answers and found ChatGPT was giving incorrect information 52% of the time, over half of the time. And this slide is really in here because when you're starting out and you have this yes, no kind of easy question, easy, straightforward question that you think, you may feel, oh, I shouldn't ask somebody this and turn to ChatGPT, but you cannot trust the information that is getting spat out at you. I tested this earlier this year by giving, um, asking, ChatGPT for a code snippet for an unimplemented feature in the Python SDK. Give me an example of, uh, what was it, tying uh, metrics to a trace with an exemplar. And it totally made up a package that did not exist, did not conform to OTEL at all, um, not runnable code, and wasted way more time um, had I genuinely been asking that. So there's really danger into turning to first page of your search engine results or LLMs to answer these easy kind of questions. So I have an order of like preference of sources that I turn to first when I'm doing this 10 to 15 minutes um, worth of research. Always, always, always starting with official project resources, the docs first, first and foremost. Um, then turning towards sort of spiraling out from there, is there a forum? Is there a mailing list? Is there a durable knowledge store or wiki that I could turn to to ask? Um, mailing lists, great. From there, that hasn't turned anything up. I'll go to a search engine of your choice. My choice is Ecosia for now. Um, and I'm not choosing, again, the first thing on the list. I'll look for a personal developer blog of, hey, this is how I stood up Podman on my Mac and it's 2024 and I'm giving you an experience report. I love that, great. Um, I know I work for a vendor, but <laughs> I tell you, I avoid vendor, <laughs> vendor resources um, until the very last moment unless I absolutely have to use them. Um, because there can be, depending on where you land on a vendor's site, um, different motivations at play than just pure knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of open source tutorials that start with, and sign up for an account here at my closed platform, and this is how you have to use this open source software, and that's just absolutely not true. So if that search engine search is fruitless, I will then resign myself to Slack, and I will first search Slack. Has anybody else asked this? and I will read the channel back scroll for, you know, I don't know, three scrolls or something. So that, if that is your research process and that's how you're spending your first 10 to 15 minutes, odds are pretty good you're gonna run into something that helps you, clarifies something, or shows you, no, you may have stumbled upon a new bug or an interesting use case that people haven't captured yet in the docs, but you've really put in the effort. And so uh, this, the next two quotes come from How I Ask Questions from Navindu Potakat, which I think really summed this up nicely from the maintainer's perspective. Um, so he started, I maintain a project called Meshery, and one of the new contributors who came in to get an internship literally asked if I could explain what Meshery is. We have a website with 100 plus pages of documentation, recordings of conference talks, and technical docs that are all sent to users as they join the community. And so, when we think about it, what is Meshery is a totally valid question, right, for an intern to ask or someone getting started, um, getting their bearings in tech. But the issue here was the lack of due diligence to even just use the resources that were handed to them on day one to answer that question. And he continued, it would have been totally different if they had approached me and instead asked, I've been going through Meshery's docs and trying it out locally. 
I'm unclear, though, how it adds value if somebody's already using a service mesh. Can you point me to any docs where this is explained better? At this point, you're not asking for a ton of labor or someone to, to do, OK, Meshery 101, sit down, you know, class has started. You're saying, I've done research, I have this question, and I want to learn more. Can you, is there something that already answers my question you can just send me a link to? That's like beautiful. Um, and I just, yeah, I love the, I will do more research if you just give me the link. So that's sort of doing your due diligence. Context is a really loaded term, specifically in open telemetry, but I think um, in tech in general. This is really referring to background context that the person on the other end of the computer won't have about you, the problem you're trying to solve, your tech stack, or organization that you're working with. So if we consider the question, what is the best telemetry pipeline for logs? That's really subjective, highly dependent on the constraints of your org, the software that you need to run, um, constraints of your industry, maybe even whether you can or cannot use open source. And either you're going to get a very short, it depends and nothing else, or you're going to get a super long answer detailing all of the different considerations and options you have that's going to be totally overkill and likely full of stuff that's not relevant to you in any way, shape, or form. So providing context is about filling in those details up front. Um, think about if somebody from Netflix was asking this, the answer they would need is a lot different than a mom and pop coffee shop that's just trying to get things up and running um, for their cash register software. So when you're asking these questions, first sharing a bit about you and your personal context, not your whole life story, but are you new to this community? Are you new to this technology? Are you new to tech in general? Um, that will give you, it's not guaranteed, but you're likely to get a lot more grace, especially if you're using, we have so much jargon in tech, if you're using words slightly incorrectly or you're kind of talking around a concept, if somebody knows you're a beginner, that's going to make a lot more sense and they can help you um, get to a plane of understanding. Um, and on the flip side, if you're experienced with something, um, like maybe you've used FluentD for a long time and your company's switching to FluentBit, it's really helpful when you're asking a question to say, oh, we've got these pipelines from FluentD. This is how we stood up our PII processing. How would I do that in FluentBit? I read the docs and it wasn't immediately clear the nuanced differences. That gives somebody, OK, a frame of reference. They understand FluentD. They understand FluentD concepts and logging pipelines in general. Let me draw some parallels to help them understand. I kind of likened this to it'd be really concerning if on day one the senior cluster ops engineer was like yo what's this kubernetes thing like i'm so curious um but that's like a totally normal question coming from people ops or someone in your family who's not in tech right so who you are and where you're coming from totally matters when you're asking questions the other piece is sharing organizational context and this isn't breaking your ndas or giving away the secret sauce to your code but it's about giving details about your stack, the scale you're operating at, and any constraints that you've got. Um, this is typically when you hear it depends, you're going you're gonna to want to fill in some of these details for folks. And it, by not providing this up front, you're making people have more work to answer your question. They're going to have 10 questions for that first one you asked, when if you came with all this information neatly packaged, they could have given you an answer right away. Um, so it really just comes down to, when you're asking your mentor or you're asking folks in your org who are colleagues questions, you skip all of that. You have shared context. They know who you are, what your team's working on, what the company cares about. But the person on the other end of Slack, of the CNCN Slack, knows none of that. So you've got to find that right level um, of information to share with them. So some questions to consider to provide this context. What is your level of understanding or experience in the domain? What don't you understand? I know how to send logs in FluentD, but I don't know how to send them in FluentBit with this one processor that we, we want to transport. What scale are you operating at? And then what, is your, what are your organizational constraints? Oh, I work in healthcare, and we have to be very clear about HIPAA or things like that that are going to be relevant to answers people provide. This might be a little tiny, but this is a really beautiful example um, of a question that's provided with context. Um, to summarize, are there any case studies on the scaling limits for the OTEL collector? We're currently heavily sampling traces. If we weren't, we'd be pushing over 10 million spans a second. 
oh my God, that little, that one number, all of a sudden adds a lot of color to the question that they're asking. Um, this is not a mom and pop shop. This is not my little side project on the side. This is um, a thriving business with lots of transactions. Um, so they say, we'd like to retain as many tr interesting traces as possible. So we're looking at this processor, but in order to do that, we'd have to send this fire hose of 10 million spans a second to a collector first. And, they, and, and so started with a question, you know, are there case studies about scaling limits of the collector? And they finish with, I'm wondering if there are case studies of real world setups at similar scale. And so, if so, are there recommendations or is this just a total non-starter? So they didn't ask, give me all the details right here in this thread. Please tell me everything right now. You know, give me the saga. They said, I just, I want more resources. Here's everything you need to know. Could you point me at that? And if not, should I just totally abandon this idea? Um, this is like, Beautiful. So the good examples, I'm very happy uh, to give people their flowers for, um, but the, the questions that could be asked better, all anonymized and amalgamations. So our third piece is considering the channel. This is both literal if you're talking about a Slack or instant messenger channel. Are you in the right place? Are you in a channel that is open for questions? Um, are you in a channel that's act actually for like the advanced users and maintainers and it's for them to talk about the project you know, plan instead of user feedback. Um, so the literal channel, and then also please ask yourself, is Slack or I am really the place for this question? Um, so can someone help me figure out why my data isn't getting to vendor? Depending on where you ask, this is a great question or this is a question that needs to not be asked in that channel. <laughs> um, this is a great question to ask your vendor. I do not think anybody likes doing free work for vendors that have a lot of resources and are supposed to be providing product support and learning um, for the community. So when you do this, uh, valid question, things that you want to ask, but consider who you're asking. And if you're asking open source folks to volunteer their time on behalf of like AWS, reroute that one to AWS, or don't be offended when somebody asks you to do that. On the should is Slack even the right place? I will editorialize and say most of the time, no. Um, Slack is not a knowledge base. Slack is not a knowledge base. Slack is not a knowledge base. Even if you're paying for retention in Slack, um, CNCF has a partnership with them. We, we have the retention. It doesn't get cut off. But it's not a durable knowledge store like a wiki or like the docs where other people can learn um, from the conversations and questions that get asked. It is horrible for searching. It is horrible for channel discovery. It is, it is not a place for, I know a lot of people get value out of it, but I personally, this is a personal page editorializing, I would prefer if everything was just in docs, wikis, and mailing lists or things that I could go back and search over time or download. Um, and that, I have lost that battle <laughs> already, but part of giving this talk is to help people think before sending or find more helpful ways to use Slack. There are plenty of great conversations and things to have um, going on in Slack, but learning and discovery, um, time and a place. So when we're considering the channel, does this benefit from asking an IM? The reason that this talk is the art of asking and not the science of asking is because there are always exception, exceptions to the rule. If you ask, is this release broken for anybody else? That might have been better off as an issue or a bug report, but it would still be helpful if the release just got cut to post in Slack, is anybody else experiencing this? If so, add on to the issue I've opened. Add your story to the bug report or whatever. Um, in that case, it's time sensitive. The release just went out and folks probably want that fast feedback. So again, um, art, not science. <laughs> uh, is this question on topic for the channel? There are some channels that are just for, um, maintainers and contributors to talk. There are some channels that are totally open for ask me anything. There are some channels that are like, no beginner questions. We're really more for the advanced use cases. And it does you well to find your way around whatever project or ecosystem you're in and figure out and star where you can ask channels um, or where you can ask questions. And then finally, could this just be an issue or a bug report? Doesn't mean you don't write the message in Slack, but it does mean that you're tying it to something more durable that will be a lot more helpful to the maintainers to see a bunch of um, issue reports versus like I'm tracking 
mean comments in Slack about our release uh, sentiment analysis stuff. Cool. Okay. Relevant details. Little breadcrumbs of discovery along the way. This is when you give folks everything they need to be able to start helping you answer a troubleshooting question. Um, relevant details are, are good for knowledge questions, but specifically troubleshooting questions um, is really important to get this um, nailed down. You give someone too few details, again, you're asking for a lot of labor. They're going to have so many follow-up questions. And you might get kind of frustrated. Why are you asking me all these questions? Well, they need it to be able to answer you. And it's actually really nice that they're giving you that time and that grace um, for that period. The other side of that spectrum is if you give too many details, as in I just plopped in a like 10 scrolled stack trace exception, like all of the logs that my service spat out, guess what? You've now lost, I have this much screen real estate and now your logs are taking up the whole thing. And I don't even know what you're trying to ask. I'm actually kind of annoyed that you did that. And so I'm going to just keep scrolling. Other people are nicer and they will maybe answer the question. Or if they see something cool in the logs, they want to help you solve. Um, but that's something that you want to thread. Or if you're opening a, a GitHub issue or something, you can use the little collapsible markdown. Please do that because what you want to focus on is the question you're asking. Um, and if you've got those details there, people will go and they will click and they will read the thread. So our question here is, well, I'm trying to send metrics to Prometheus. And I set the scrape endpoint correctly, just trust me, but no metrics are being sent. Any help appreciated. So <laughs> the scrape endpoint is set correctly is where this question went a little bit awry because I don't know that. You didn't give me your config. Um, I'm always, always suspicious. You always want to get as much detail as you can up front. And so that's, it's not a problem that you want help figuring this out. It is a problem that now someone is going to have to ask you, Show me your config for Prometheus. Is this running locally? Where is this running? Are you trying to use HTTPS? Like, oh my gosh, so many things that if you had provided that up front, someone could be like, oh, I've seen this before. <laughs> oh, here's, try this out. Let me know how it works. Um, it's all about making things easier, asking questions that get answered, and making it easy for folks to answer them, even if they're tricky and complex questions. And so a little bit of a story time, because I think, what is relevant? What's not relevant? Um, I have tattoos. <laughs> I went for a long time to a traditional tattoo artist. This is people who do the sailor traditional style, a lot of like anchors and stuff like that. Um, and I said, I want a cute shark tattoo. And this is what I got sent. This like angry high school mascot, like, rawr. and I was like, Ooh, no, <laughs> uh, not that, um, Shark, yes, cute, I, debatable, um, but I'm not an artist. So I had to figure out what is the like, what is the essence of what I need to communicate to him? And with my lack of skills, how can I overcome that and, and just communicate to, so that I'm not getting something permanently on my body that I'm not into? <laughs> and so I literally sent <laughs> this. I grabbed a post-it note because I was I was like panicked. The, the appointment was booked. The money was, you know, the down payment was there. Like this was happening. So I was like, oh my God, he's got to redo this. And I was like, it's the equivalent of napkin math. It was the equivalent of taking my complex production system, boiling it down to a hello world and adding the couple little lines that were going wrong for me. Um, and like, this was not a lot to go off of. So I give Josh a lot of credit for coming back and <laughs> giving me this. And you can see, you can see he got it. He totally nailed the smile, the happiness. I essentially sent him a picture of a goldfish cracker and he got it. And so the good news is you don't have to guess what details are relevant for troubleshooting um, because you can always go to your project's bug report, pull it up. You don't have to file it, but they typically have a really good template of things that they want answered. Um, and you can just copy paste that. Um, and, and sort of keep it in your notes. So the one folks struggle with a lot is what is the problem you're trying to solve at the end of the day? What are you trying to do? Not what failed and what you want to fix, but what are you trying to do? Then there's this comparison. What did you expect to happen, but what happened instead? So this isn't, uh, I tried to send metrics to Prometheus and I got this error. Okay, well, were you sending a push? Were you sending them pull? Were you, you know, what, what was going on there? What are the steps that I can use to reproduce this? If I 
if I have a free afternoon and I'm cruising CNCF Slack and I feel like, you know, helping out and I want to be able to run this on my own, that's the very first thing I need to be able to do is to set it up on my machine, get the same problem so I can be able to kind of hack on that. There are details about what OS you're using, what version of the software you're using, the environment it's running in, et cetera. And then when it comes to code and config snippets, um, kind of the, the trifecta word that I kept coming across was minimal, complete, and reproducible. And while Stack Overflow is not my go-to anymore, did not show up on my list of trusted resources, they do have one good post um, that's very detailed that I've linked in the end about um, the literal formatting of technical questions um, over the internet. Um, it was way too much to include, so I've included it in a link in the end um, if you're curious about that. Um, but I've tried to do the, the highlights. So minimal, restart from scratch and add in as you go. What are the minimal things that you could send somebody to reproduce this error, this issue, whatever? Simplify your variable names. This is also where you could get into danger just copy pasting random code from your company and putting it on the internet. Um, sometimes those things are specially protected or you know, secret tiger team project. So really make sure that you're doing due diligence there. Um, so the minimal thing, I don't wanna have to run like a kind cluster and then a Helm chart just to like figure, help you figure out a config thing. Um, complete, this is really specific and no screenshots of code. Screenshots of UI, yes, when it's relevant, but code, I, I'm not gonna sit there and peck and transcribe from a screenshot code into my editor. Um, and doubt very many people are willing to do the same. So copy the actual text over. Um, complete log files that you then collapse. Complete stack traces, not just the little bit, not just the last thing, but give everybody the full picture of what happened, the full story, um, so that they can follow. And then reproducible, we've talked about, can someone take only what you've provided and to run and verify the issue. And then when you're asking knowledge questions, I need to learn this thing, there's a concept thing, well, really figure out what is it that you're seeking. Do you want links to docs? Do you want a link to a conference talk? Or like that question we heard earlier, I want case studies of similar sized organizations. Do you want an example code or config snippet that you can drop in? I'd love to learn how to deploy the operator with a Helm chart or there's so many ways to package Kubernetes applications. But um, what is it that you want at the end of the day? Or are you asking for like a code change? I need something fixed or I need a new feature. That um, will help you narrow down the question. So it's not help me learn or what is meshery or help me learn about open telemetry, but it's, hey, I'm the new team lead. Um, we're about to start re-instrumenting with open telemetry and I'd really love some videos that go over other companies doing the migration. Like, that's great, someone will drop you a link. You may have follow-ups, um, but you've made it really easy to answer that question. And then for knowledge things, just clarifying, what do you already understand? I know Fluent D, I don't know Fluent Bit. I know Python, but I'm learning Go. Like, give somebody that frame of reference so they can help draw metaphors and parallels. They all break down, but they're very helpful to get to the same plane of understanding. And it's also, Equally important to explain what you don't understand. What is it specifically about this concept you're hung up on? Um, that is the part that sometimes people can feel shy about, um, but it's really important because if somebody starts throwing a bunch of jargon at you and you don't know what they're saying, they're going to think they answered your question and walk away and you're going to be left like even more confused and maybe with some new terms to look up, but you won't have that knowledge you are seeking. So. The last step is giving back. As I have um, been learning about open source, it is a give and a take. And right now it feels like there's a lot of take and not a lot of give. And I think questions can be this really, really beautiful way for you to start giving back to the projects that you use, um, consume and contribute to. Um, it's really likely you're not the only person to run into this issue that you're troubleshooting or need to know about some concepts that maybe isn't clearly explained in the docs. And so if all you do is ask in this IM, someone drives by, they answer it, you go about your day and you don't ever follow up um, or you just kind of close out and walk away and, and maybe it did fix your problem but you never told everybody, the next time someone goes to ask, they'll be like, oh my God, somebody already asked this. Click on it and go, oh, cool. I'm still on my own but this person knew, this person, found out the knowledge and then just disappeared. So 
on the maintainer side, when you kind of just abandon these these questions or the help that people have given you, your the maintainers are likely to get variants of the same exact questions over and over again. And it, um, like I experienced on the field, it's very fatiguing. It is not fun to get the same types of questions that are answered on like page one of the docs. Um, now, and I think the XKCD here, um, basically it's like, who were you Denver coder nine? What did you see? Never have I felt so close to another soul and yet so, so helplessly alone as when I Google an error and the one result is a thread by someone with the same problem and no answer. Last posted to in 2003, right? That, that happens a lot. I more than once have found a forum thread that like totally saved my bacon, um, which is why I love forums and not Slack. So what you wanna remember is open source is powered by volunteers. Is that right? Should people be paid for this work? Should companies be contributing a lot more resources? Absolutely. But as it stands today, when you're asking folks in open source questions and getting help on your learning journey or troubleshooting, you're largely given volunteer effort. And so you want to pay it forward, or I want you to pay it forward. You may not want that yet, but hopefully by the end of this talk, yes. <laughs> um, because it seems counterintuitive, right? I go to this channel, the experts are there. They write this, they maintain this. Um, they're the best person to answer this question. But actually, if you study learning theory, which I did not, um, I'm more of a like citizen scientist, but they have found that when you first learn something, when you're able to go to somebody else and explain it to them or answer their question, it actually helps you learn it even better and it sticks more. So what you could do, um, this doesn't mean, okay, somebody answered my question and now I have to go like become a contributor and sign up to be a maintainer. No, no, there's, there's a spectrum. The minimum is following up with a note of appreciation, reporting back on your results, um, right in the thread where you asked. This means whoever stumbles across it in the future is gonna have that loop closed for them and you'll be helping out the future people who have done their due diligence and read the back scroll. The next level is capturing this in information in a knowledge base, adding to the docs, um, at least within OpenTelemetry and at least within OpenTelemetry Python, there's a whole cookbook, which are code snippets, config snippets, really quick examples, how do I, instrument a metric with OTEL? How do I add a nested span? And it's just that one little bit that you need. So if you had something that kind of straightforward that you weren't able to find in the docs, you will get a lot of a lot of love if you're like, hey, thanks for answering that. I've actually opened up a PR to add this to the cookbook. The next person will be able to find it. And then finally, answering similar questions in the future. Again, like when you help other people understand, your understanding deepens. Um, so those are not, that's not heavy weight. There's a lot of other ways you could help, but this is like, at a minimum, let's let's like shoot for this. Now this question, okay, oh good, it's, it's popping up big. I'll read this because I think it's just the bow on top. Hello folks, I'm new to open telemetry and I found that I've been missing out not setting traces, metrics, and logs for my projects. Currently trying to set up OTEL in a Rust project, but I'm not confident that I'm doing it correctly. There aren't many working examples for the latest versions, due diligence, and I've encountered a conflict with tracing open telemetry. Crate, I think that's what the Rust people call them, crates, uh, library, whatever. <laughs> he says, or they say, I'll post my current config in this thread. Yay, thread. Hopefully it will help someone and maybe others can spot my mistakes or suggest improvements. I plan to create a more comprehensive example to keep updated for anyone else new to open telemetry and Rust. I do have a question. Why is a metrics layer usually included in the subscriber? Like that is the master class in asking. I'm going to give back. I did my due diligence. I didn't find any other examples. Here's some context about what I'm trying to do. Um, and oh yeah, here's the actual question I wanna ask um, aside from this other context. So when we're putting it all together, it can kind of look like a big list. Due diligence, background context, consider the channel, relevant details, give back. And your first step on all of this, maybe write those down, keep it by you, is to just rubber duck 
turn to a little rubber ducky or your cat or your dog and just verbalize what you're trying to ask before you type it in anywhere. Because halfway to verbalizing or formalizing it, sometimes you stumble across the answer or you really figure out what is missing that you need to add or rephrase to that question. Oh my gosh, I did another <laughs> beautiful question example. I think in the interest of time, um, I will, <sighs> let me pull out the, no, I, I included things that were relevant. I want everyone to get their flowers for good questions. Let me pull out the relevant piece. Um, hey all, I'm trying to get my head around a gauge work, how a gauge works. In the past, I've done this using Prometheus Client, tying it to here's my foundation of knowledge, here's the ecosystem I'm coming from, and a scraping web service, but that means adding flask to the mix and data storage, so I'm hoping to avoid it. The bit that isn't clear from the docs is how I set the value of a gauge from a dynamic source. I've looked at a link to the specific documentation, that is beautiful, but that seems to suggest I should be doing the data eval and the callback, which isn't possible, blah, 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 blah. The point that was great here, I'm linking to the exact docs I've used. I've told you that I've read them and I've given you a frame of reference. I'm coming from Prometheus, but open telemetry gauges seem a little funky. What's going on there? Yeah, good job, Matthew. So this slide deck is available on um, Slides Go and if uh, I will post it on my Mastodon, pagerduty at hackyderm. So you can use all, of, I want everybody to go to these resources, use them. There are a lot of details and specific things that will help you along the way to asking good questions, the Purdue ChatGPT study, um, if you're curious. And then if you are a maintainer or you're on the op side or you're working to provide a service to other teams, actually, and you want to avoid these low effort questions and you don't want to be seen as like, you want to communicate your expectations of questions very professionally and nicely. I really like, and I also try to avoid Reddit, but the advanced knitting subreddit has a really, really great approachable, here's what we expect when you come to advanced knitting. These are how you try to ask questions. These are the types of questions we avoid. Here's why. Um, but don't feel like you can't ask. We'll tell you um, if we want you to reroute it to like our knitting, but like, here's this community. Here's what we're here for. Um, and I think it's a really nice model to pull from some of the phrasing there. So. Um, this presentation template came from slidesgo.com, highly recommend them, icons from Flat Icon, and images from freepick.com. With that, thank you very much. Uh, you can find me mostly everywhere, PagerDuty with an I. Uh, I have a blog. Uh, I'm on Twitter, but I really don't want to be there, guys, so let's just do Mastodon <laughs> or LinkedIn. It's a work thing. It's fine. Uh, thank you. <laughs>
For my personal learning, uh, for a long time I kept an obsidian, um, which is, uh, is sort of a notebook that you keep in Markdown. That was amazing to tag, to search. Um, I am like a polyglot when it comes to stationery, so I have like paper notebooks, I have the my iPad notebooks. I did do the obsidian thing for a while. Um, I just can't stick to one thing. I think if you start a log, I mean, if I had gone back to a beginning and kept a log of the questions I asked and the concepts I was trying to learn, that would be a data mine, like a gold data mine for me today. Um, and so I think what I love that you do is I'm gonna have to do this process again, or I'm gonna need to know the specific data or the frequency or, or the r amateur radio things. And it's a personal sort of run book of sorts. I think, yeah, if you develop that for yourself first, it's the first step to sharing it with your team, sharing it with a project. Um, I think it's a great idea. I just don't have the discipline <laughs> to keep to one uh, one type of notebook. Yes. Uh, this is a historical question. Uh, no, sure. It's feeling like that it would be a lot more difficult to ask questions of the public service person in a historical sense. Uh, history class. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I do think the rise of, of Slack and the instant message is the double-edged sword because it sounds like before there was probably a lot of questions that went unanswered or people didn't even ask or even know where to find to ask. And we've almost swung too much in the other direction to make it too, too trivial. If Slack even had a pop-up that asked those things, what are you trying to do? What OS, you know, like something as simple as that could make a huge difference in the utility of the convos there. Um, I have actually never been on IRC. I, I, I'm like, I, I don't want to say I'm afraid of it, but I'm like, I don't know. All I've known is HipChat and Slack. I'm a little enterprise vendor baby. So what? <laughs> oh, it is. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Should I join? What is happening on IRC? Is it still going on? Some? Okay. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I don't think I would have enjoyed uh coming up uh, a couple decades ago in tech. I definitely appreciate the the world that I I kind of came into. Um but yeah, and and that's the other part is like you could even ask a really well-formed question, but somebody could still be really snarky or you may not get the right answer. It might be the wrong person. They could be in a bad mood. Um, but if you do all those steps, you know, oh, no, 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 I did my part. I was responsible here. That is totally on you. And that's your own attitude problem to deal with. <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah. I just more of a comment. Sure. Uh, yeah. With that last example you brought up, I really love when people put links. In their yes. Like, yes. <laughs> not just because it shows the due diligence, but also like in the follow up, like you know where where to go to improve that documentation afterwards. It's all right there. Yeah, links, links, links. And if uh, I just have to, because it is my other soapbox, please never send somebody a picture of a graph. Um, this is more for colleagues that you work with in the workplace who have access to your monitoring stack, your Prometheus or whatever, but I can't do anything with the screenshot. I am going to want to see what that query is. I'm going to see the time scale. There's a lot of interrogation I'm going to want to do. So I really save screenshots for this thing in the UI is broken. Here's what happened before or after or something. But yeah, links, context. Um, are, is there anybody that's a maintainer here that would like to weigh in on traits of questions, things you'd like, traits of questions? Oh my god. Here I am in the art of asking, asking a horribly convoluted question. Are there any maintainers that want to weigh in on feedback for asking better questions? I would love to hear the wisdom. No? Yeah? Uh, so uh, we get a lot of user pictures, and uh, sometimes it's obvious that they haven't done their homework. And what I, what I mean sure. is sometimes they haven't used the software. Oh. The web okay. And, uh, so uh, this happened recently, and I, I was like, I, I suppose it's not rude in this instance just to say you need to do your homework. You're like, yeah. step one is you need to use the software here, you yeah. know, and this is going to be up and running. And here's a couple other links that you can see in the documentation. Yeah. I think that's 
Oh, totally. No. Yeah, and write a blog about your experience so other people can do that. Or even pinning that comment so when you've, if you've done the work to assemble, here's what you need to know to get started as a contributor, make it reusable. Put it somewhere where you're not going to have to repeat that over and over. Or you can just point to a link. Um, yeah. I, I've heard of a called Hmm, I haven't heard that. Mm. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I think both are totally appropriate. Both here's the, you know, oh, this isn't right for this channel. Here's the link to the channel you want. But again, even better is I'll, I'll see you over there. I'll, I'll answer that question. I love that. Like, I'll, I'll be with you. Um, and yeah, specific, specifically with open telemetry, there's one catch-all hotel channel, um, and it's very clear that it is a bit of a traffic control situation. Come here first to ask, and then we'll get you to the right place if this isn't the appropriate channel. And um, that's just on you as the asker to be uh, take that with grace. Like that's fine. They, they they want you to ask just in a different area. On the whole, asking questions is good. We're gonna do it. And uh, yes. Question. Yes. Um, mm. If it's useful to uh, link back to chat, for example, if someone asks a question in chat and then when you refer to a, an issue thread, is it useful to link that issue thread back to the chat? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I haven't, I think I'll have to think about it some more. I don't think it's bad to link back to relevant chat threads if the where you're asking the person you're asking is also in there, or it's not too much of a stretch that they would be joining and have an account there. Um, if you were worried about the durability, you could copy paste the, the relevant hits of that chat, but that's a little more work. Um, I was curious that I did want to call out Slack because I was like, I'm specifically talking about Slack. I had a feeling there were some other, I've heard of Zulip, I've heard of Matrix before, and I figured they had some different models. And if the persistence is there, or if there's a way to turn a channel into like a you know, like a Reddit forum or something like that's my dream is let the people that love I am live there. But please, dear God, let me have a forum or something I can search like a wiki. Um, somebody's got to be working on that. Yeah, so we're going to ask questions. We also know how to answer questions. So uh, if you get a badly or a question that could be asked better, you now know, hey, these are the things I need um, and sharing that with folks. So go forth, ask away. And thank you so much.